Voice on the Talk Station, FM 107, AM 1240. It's a great, with great honor and pleasure and, and a little bit of excitement, to be very blunt, to have joining us this afternoon, Dinesh D'Souza. Of course, he is renowned, fame for a variety of items. Of course, a recent uh, video is a very successful video associated with the current administration. The, the one that everybody has reference to, of course, of Obama's America. But also, I have to give note, our guest, as well as an author and a filmmaker, is in his activities, in his writings, a Christian apologist. And of course, if people are wondering the term apologist, meaning someone who explains, it's not to apologize for, but rather to educate and to explain. Our guest this afternoon, Dinesh D'Souza, the topic, his most recent book, America, Imagine a World Without Her. And with that, uh, Mr. D'Souza, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to be with us this afternoon. Delighted to be on the program. This is an interesting book, and I want to go directly to the premise and then a, a variety, hundreds of questions. My apologies on that, but... Tell us the premise of the book. Obviously, I, I can I can imagine that with the title, but let's let's start with your observations, the reason you wrote it, and the premise. Well, uh, I'm an immigrant who was um, born and raised in Bombay, India. Um, I came to America at the age of 17, and so I've seen America not just from the inside, but also from the outside. And in this book, I'm just raising a big question, which is, what would the world look like if there had never been an America? You know, there, now, there are different ways that could have happened. Uh, if George Washington were, had been shot by a sniper's bullet, uh, then you'd have the land mass of America, but of course you wouldn't have the American Revolution, you wouldn't have the Declaration of Independence, you wouldn't have had the Constitution. This America that we have now would not exist. Or, or, or imagine if the Nazis had gotten the atomic bomb first. They had a very sophisticated atomic project. Uh, had they gotten the bomb, they would surely have dropped it, and the world would be totally different. Now, the reason I'm asking these types of questions is because I'm projecting forward to say, what will the future Future look like if America as a country begins to shrink or recede in importance? And I, I think that the future will be much more bleak if it has a smaller America. In fact, uh, you contend that really America is the great hope for Western civilization. Am I correct on that? Yes, most of Europe was leveled after World War II, and the baton of leadership passed from Europe to America. Of course, it was America that rebuilt much of Europe after the war, mm -hmm. and even rebuilt Japan. So what, what worries me, though, is not that America is facing threats from abroad, because today there are no Nazis on the horizon, or the Soviet empire, of course, is gone. There are some annoying Iranian mullahs and so on. But our real threat comes from within America. And what concerns me is there's a very powerful movement, not just in politics, but in education, in the media, in Hollywood, that in a sense is trying to shame America mm -hmm. and remake America. That's, that's Obama's phrase, remake America. And of course, to remake something, you have to unmake the thing that's there now. I'm looking at a recent New York Times uh, headline that said, America, land of thieves. The the obvious aspect of this, and and it's also coming about in my in my estimation, is that we're seeing the rewriting of history in the process. I I, I want to get into the details on this in a moment. Just to remind everyone, our guest is Dinesh D'Souza. He is the author of the most recent book, and all of his books, by the way, have been very highly acclaimed. America, imagine a world without her. The question then, Mr. D'Souza, is that. To what end? Why are we seeing this, if you will, reinterpretation of history? And, and, and I'm seeing this in a variety of areas. We're seeing this relative to, and I'll bring something close to home, the subject of the, of the Civil War. The efforts to rename schools that have been named after Robert E. Lee, for example. This whole area of we're trying to reshape history. Uh, the question goes to, to what end? Why? Well, the uh, the people who are trying to rewrite history and to shame America pretend like they're doing it because they are just giving you the facts. They're just giving you the truth. They're, in fact, trying to correct a kind of over-enthusiastic 
a portrait of, of America that was given in the past. But of course, they're not giving you the facts. What they do is they troll through hundreds of years of American history. They basically pick out the facts that put America in the worst light, and then they string those facts together in a narrative of American disgrace and shame. Now, why are they doing it? They're doing it to clear the way for a political shakedown. See, if someone were to come to you and say, listen, all the stuff that's in your house, your furniture, your TV, your car, all of it is stolen goods. It's stolen goods because either you stole it through capitalism or through the depredations of American foreign policy, but even if you didn't steal it, your ancestors stole it. And it doesn't matter if you're putting it to good use because the truth of it is it doesn't belong to you. You're kind of like in possession of Nazi art treasures that were taken from somebody else's collection or somebody else's home. And so you have an obligation to give them back. And if, you, if you're not willing to do it, then the government has the duty and, in fact, the right to come and take it. So I think what's going on here is that there is a – all of this shaming of America is a ploy. It's a strategy to justify and create the moral room for government redistribution and government confiscation of the wealth of Americans. Then uh, I'll accept that for the moment. We'll, we'll work from that premise. Again, to what end? I mean, uh, is this in an effort to create, if you will, a monarchy, an oligarchy? Because you're, you're taking, and not to disagree with you, but you're taking the very core that makes the success possible. Right. But uh, see, the people who are in any society, there are winners and losers. So, for example, in an aristocratic society, the winners, of course, are the, the counts, the barons, the marquis, the, the aristocrats. And the losers are the serfs. And the serfs have to do all the work. Uh, and they get to keep a small portion of their, of, their, um, of their farming product. But the aristocrats take most of it. So the serfs are the losers. In an entrepreneurial society, uh, the greatest rewards tend to go to people who know how to create wealth, who know how to make stuff that other people want to buy. A good example would be somebody like Steve Jobs. Now, Steve Jobs isn't stealing from anyone. He just created a product. In fact, uh, a product that's so innovative that most of us didn't even know we wanted it until he made it. And then we happily parted with our money to buy it. And that's what creates income inequality. We give him money. That makes him rich. It's the consumers that create, in a sense, inequality in America. Now, here's is the point. So this is how wealth gets created. But on the other hand, there are many people in America who are left out of this. Think of the, the journalist. Now, the journalist is living in an age today where it's barely possible to scrape together a living. So the journalist will look at the entrepreneur with eyes of resentment and even hatred to say, why do we have a society where you do so well and I'm struggling? It must be because something is fundamentally unjust. I would like to have a society in which power is shifted away away from you and toward me. So I think what we are seeing is there's an alliance between the intellectual class, the political class, the media, in a sense to shift power in the society away from the military, away from the entrepreneurs, and toward, if you will, resentful community organizers of the Obama stripe. It's, it's akin, really, because you're in a different room on the boat I'm not happy, so I'm just going to drill a hole in the bottom of the boat and let the water flood the boat, let it sink. That way we're all equal, drowning. Well, this, this is actually what is happening because as America begins to take on water, the American ship, the Chinese ship and the Brazilian ship and the Russian ship are gaining momentum. Those countries are building their wealth and building their strength. Um, and and in, to some degree, I think from Obama's point of view and from the progressives' point of view, even that's not a bad thing. And the reason is, the way they look at it is they think that America's wealth, the fact that America, for example, has 5% of the world's population, but uses 20% of the world's oil, or, has, or uses 25% of the world's overall gross national product. So the progressives think, well, that's unfair, because our wealth is accumulated through centuries of imperialism, conquest, 
and not to mention all the conquests that occurred within America. So there's this kind of indictment of America that, beginning from the, the act of taking the country from the Indians, that the wealth of America is thievery, and that therefore if we see some shrinking in our standard of living, if our boat does take on more water, morally that may be a good thing. Our guest, Dinesh D'Souza, the book, America, Imagine a World Without Her. Of course, you're listening to Viewpoints here on the talk station, FM 107, AM 1240. Hey, it's Big John R. Buy, sell, trade, and give stuff away on Swap Shop, Saturday mornings at 7 on the talk station. Viewpoints on the talk station, FM 107, AM 1240. We're continuing our conversation with Dinesh D'Souza, the author of America, Imagine a World Without Her. The question, and I, I alluded to this earlier, related to the term Christian apologetics. And I want to touch on two issues here related to your book, America, Imagine a World Without Her, that the role of religion and education. I, I'm going to start with religion, just on the off chance that that takes a little longer than I anticipate. You yourself have seen this. You come from a, a country, by the way, just as an aside, if I'm not mistaken, please feel free to correct me, the largest democracy in the world, India. You come to this country, you're an immigrant, you see the value and the, and the opportunities it's sad that we take it for granted, and I want to, I want to talk about that in the relation of, of education. But first and foremost, the issue of religion. I, I intentionally brought up the issue of uh, Christian apologetics. Does that play a role in this issue of both an effort to, I, I'm looking for a description, but basically to diminish the value of this country, its culture, and in the process, does it play a role in the establishment of guilt? Yes, well, religion, particularly here, Christianity, uh, um, you can say Judeo Christianity, um, has had a foundational role in America. I'm not just talking about the religiosity of right. the founders, I'm talking about the way in which our core principles uh, of dignity, uh, equality, equality of rights, these ideas come from Christianity. So here's Jefferson. Now, Jefferson wasn't particularly orthodox as a Christian. But when the founders told him, hey, go, go, go tell us why all men are created equal, go write it all down, Jefferson could think of only one source for equality, and that's the creator. In other words, we're not equal in size or strength or speed or maybe even moral character, but we're equal in the eyes of God. And so that transcendent equality translates into political equality. Uh, and then later, when Martin Luther King, by the way, the Reverend Martin Luther King, says, I'm submitting a promissory note, and I'm demanding that it be cashed. The promissory note that he's referring to is none other than the Declaration of Independence. So the civil rights movement is really made possible. Its principles are an appeal right back uh, to the American founding. So this gives a small uh, idea of how Christianity has had a, a, a crucial role in establishing the core principles of America. All the more reason why we're trying to diminish the value of uh, Christianity and, and an issue, quite frankly, of recognizing and responding to a higher authority then, that we're, mankind is replaced. We've put mankind, uh, with humanism, back into the center of the universe. And in the process, I, I go back to this issue, to what end? Who is going to be the beneficiary of this? Well, I think that what's, what you're seeing here is an attack on, uh, not only on Christianity specifically, but also on the concept of religious freedom. Right. Because the concept of religious freedom is that, that in a free society, people have the space to practice their own faith as they see it. Uh, and now, in the name of anti-discrimination and other things, what you really have is an attempt to limit 
uh, religious freedom to say that no, if you're a Catholic hospital, you have to provide right. abortion services. Right. No, uh, if you're a Christian, you ha- your church has to uh, do this and has to do that, or the government will shut you down. So this is a very scary thing because religious freedom is one of the core principles of America. I mean, it's right there in the First Amendment, uh, right along with freedom of speech. So once these core freedoms begin to be trampled upon, really our country, whatever we pay lip lip service to, does become a different country in its actual practices. The book, America, Imagine a World Without Her, I want to move then to the uh, final subject associated with this, Mr. D'Souza, and of course that is the topic of education. Is education the primary source of readjusting, for want of a better description, the outlook and the philosophy of this country? If I talk to young people today, even at fine schools or colleges, uh, I realize that they have a completely doctored account of their own history. Uh, And now, for the young people themselves, they're ignorant, so you can't blame them. Mm -hmm. But their teachers are not ignorant. The teachers are the the ones who are doctoring the account. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that young people have a very selective view. They know about seven facts about American history. They begin with the evils of Columbus. They march right forward to the hypocrisy of the American founders. Gee, those people said all men are created equal, but they still had slaves. then they, then they fast forward, and pretty much in no time they're at the 60s, and good things don't really begin in America till the 1960s. Now, the remarkable thing about this account of history is it jumps over decades, even centuries. It leaves out huge events, the Industrial Revolution, the First Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening. All these smart young people have never really, have nothing intelligent to say about any of that. They have a ridiculously comical amount of detail about the seven facts that they do know. You know, how many railroad cars were there on the Underground Railroad? They know that. Uh, what was Rosa Parks' middle name? They know that. But on the other hand, they, you know, they don't know what Edison did. Um, and, uh, and they leave out. They don't know how many northern white soldiers died in the Civil War. So what's really happened is they're getting, if you will, a view of American history calculated uh, to produce shame. And no wonder our young people then lose confidence in this country and don't have the same patience patriotism that their parents and grandparents did. And yet, to go back to a comment you made earlier about Stephen Jobs, yet it's this country and it's the entrepreneurs in this country that have made our life so fabulous, so so exceptional, so opportunistic. You know, it's almost, it's almost for want of a better description, shooting the person that is bringing you food. Why? I, I, <laughs> well, this is because this is a truly uh, tragic because for centuries human beings have clawed a living out of the right, ground. Right. And if you look at the standard of living of the world in even 1800 and compare it, let's say, to 800, uh, you know, A.D. or even the time of Christ, the, the differences are not so great. The real revolution in human uh, standard of living, in life expectancy, in abundance, has really occurred in the last century and a half. And it's really occurred because of the American idea of wealth creation. America didn't invent the idea, but America is the first society to be based on it. Uh, and so that's why America has led the world in creating mass prosperity, prosperity enjoyed not just by the aristocrat, but by the ordinary guy. And it's really sad to see that other countries are now taking our formula and running with it, whereas here in the age of Obama and perhaps the age to come of Hillary, this, this American formula that, that's worked for us and is now working for them is being undermined in our own country. Let me challenge you before we wrap things up, uh, Dinesh D'Souza, our guest, American Imagine a World Without Her, and I want to wrap that up with what we can expect if we don't reverse our course. You point to Obama, you point to Hillary, but there are so many others, are there not, Mr. D'Souza, that are, that are responsible for this? Yes. Uh, in the new book, uh, I, and then in a film, by the way, I'm releasing a big film that comes out for the 4th of July, also called America, Imagine a World Without Her. So in the book and the film, I point out that, look, one guy or even two guys cannot remake America by themselves. It's just not possible. You need a powerful movement to do it. 
And we have a powerful movement, uh, not just in politics, but also in education, mm -hmm. uh, in the media. This is the progressive movement, and Obama didn't create it. Uh, in fact, it created him. Uh, and without understanding this movement, without understanding what they're up to, there's no way to know how to resist them and how to defeat them. So the book and the movie are aimed at really um, increasing people's awareness of what's going on right under their nose in this country. Uh, it, can, it can be turned around, but it requires a, a kind of a, an alertness to what's going on and a willingness to fight for what has made this country what it is. As we close, would you tease us with what would the world be without America? Well, in the words of uh, Hobbes, it would be more nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, the lives of uh, the conquest ethic that has defined history from the beginning, in which people get rich not by creating wealth, but by taking other people's stuff. That is alive and well in the world. Uh, America stands for the alternative idea, which is consent and wealth creation. So America is very much needed, not just for our welfare, but also for the world today. Uh, and and, and I, 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 I I hope and pray that America does not shrink in the way that some of our leaders wanted to. Our guest, and I thank him for being with us this afternoon, Dinesh D'Souza, the book, America, Imagine a World Without Her. Thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. It's a pleasure. Viewpoints on the talk station, FM 107, AM 1240.